Meine Damen und Herren, es ist eine große Freude. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to welcome you today to the Berlin Demography Days. Also on behalf of our co-organizer Diakonie Deutschland and our international partners. I will get back to them later. My name is Andreas Edel. I had the Secretariat of Population Europe, one of a network carried by Max Planck Gesellschaft. It today unites 39 demographic demographic research institutions in Europe. Allow me to continue in English now in order to welcome our participants from all over the world. I would like to welcome you to the Berlin Demography Days, also on behalf of our co-organizer Diakonie Deutschland and our international partners, uh, to whom I will come back later. We are delighted to have you with us. Allow me to be begin this uh, morning in English to welcome the international audience following us. The Berlin Demography Days have been taking place for more than a decade now. They have evolved from a format that started in 2012 under the name Berlin Demography Forum and has become the Berlin Demography Days since 2021. But our approach has always been the same. Let's bring together people from different backgrounds. Let's bring together scientific evidence, practical experience, the needs of policymakers and the perspectives of citizens to discuss the latest developments and most of all, to learn from each other. As the title of the event series suggests, the focus is on demographic change, often referred to as a mega trend. In other words, one of the major drivers of our future. And indeed, demography affects most policies you can think of and all groups within a society. Just think about health policy, labor market policy, pension policy, education policy, of course, family policy and migration policy. They are all driven by demographic patterns. And this is true, of course, both globally and in Europe, its member states and regions. That is why we are particularly proud that a global audience is joining us from all over the world. For the online events and tonight's live event, we have more than 1,000 registrations from over 85 countries. This year, we look at a very pressing issue. How we experience crisis, how we deal with them, and what we can learn from them. Many say that we are living in a time of poorly crisis, multiple, sometimes overlapping, or interrelated crisis. Some have the feeling that we are in a permanent crisis mode. In fact, crisis mode has just been voted the word of the year 2023 in Germany. Many people feel overwhelmed with the many changes that we have experienced in recent years or even by life-threatening developments. The problems and challenges are just as complex. Our experience is that dialogue between stakeholders, experts and citizens is the best way to unravel this complexity. Before I hand over uh, to the moderator of the first panel, our successes, our failures, COVID-19 management put on the test, let me begin with some thanks. First of all, to our cooperation partner, Diakonie Deutschland, but also to our international partners and allow me to read them loud in alphabetical order and with great gratitude. The African Institute for Development Policy, the Association Internationale de Démographes de Langue Française, Associazione, Associazione Italiana per gli Studi di Popolazione, the Bocconi University, the British Society for Population Studies, Deutsche Gesellschaft für Demographie, the European Association for Population Studies, the Federal Institute for Population Research, the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population, the Netherlands Vereinigung for Demography, the, and last not least, the United Nations Population Fund. We also would like to thank the following partners for their support of the Berlin Demography Days, the European Union in the framework of the Futurist Project, the Förderfonds Wissenschaft in Berlin, the German Federal Ministry of for Family Affairs, Senior Citizens, Women and Youth, the German, German Federal Ministry of Health, the German Federal Ministry of the Interior and Community, and the Stifterverband. Finally, I would like to thank most of those who give essence and inspiration to our event, the many eminent experts and speakers who are joining us today and tomorrow. Thank you for sharing your valuable insights and experiences with us. It's much appreciated. And let me not forget those who organized this event behind the scenes. First and foremost, my two colleagues, Kate Dearden, and Peter Weissenberger, 
who have done an outstanding job over the past months to make the Berlin Demography Days happen. But also the agencies who provide support in the background, namely Compact Team, Rent Event, and the translation agency of Johannes Hampel, who you can hear in the background. So let me wish you and us a very inspiring, exciting, and impressive Berlin Democracy for days. Thank you for your attention, and now I hand over to Ender. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the opening panel of this year's Berlin Demography Days. Our successes, our failures, COVID-19 management put to the test. Uh, my name is Ondar Jamuti. I'm project coordinator at Population Europe. And it is my great pleasure to moderate a session with such eminent speakers today. Uh, it will be a bilingual discussion. I recommend you to switch to English channel now. There you can follow the English live uh, interpretation of the speeches or questions raised in German. And uh, now I will do the same announcement, short announcement in German. We are bitten English Deutsche Übersetzung an. The click and see after. We're the offering a translation. Please click the little globe at the bottom and select the German language. You may as well ask questions in German or in English by selecting the language and uh, by clicking Q and A and uh, key the question. And we have. And after the COVID-19 pandemic, I will ask uh, two rounds of questions to our speakers, expert speakers, and then I will open the floor for your questions, which you can send us by clicking on the Q&A button below on your screen. I would like to start with uh, Mr. Eugen Brisch, who has been the chairperson of the German Patient Protection Foundation in Dortmund since 1997. Uh, German Patient Protection Foundation is a non-profit organization and is financed uh, exclusively by contributions and donations from its members and supporters. And uh, Mr. Brisch, your organization uh, places importance on the rights of patients, people and care and health institutions, and you were observing the health and care institutions during the pandemic closely. So a general question to start with, what did we learn in the last four years? How could you describe our successes and failures? Well, first of all, a very good morning to everyone in this group. If we keep on mind the question, which successes there are and uh, place the focus on those people who generally should have been in the focus during the pandemic, namely multimorbid people, people requiring care, then it's getting extremely difficult for me to talk about successes because the situation is extremely sobering. Because if we solely throw a glance at those people in need of care, we have to state that those who were either institutionalized, and in Germany this is the by far lower part of the 5 million people who are under care in Germany, or who need community services at home, then it's more than striking that there was an extraordinary risk for people requiring care of being in an institution and becoming infected with COVID and die there. This risk was so extraordinary in addition to the overall cohort we have in focus that this is depressing. And this is why I have a hard time using the word successes. Because if we take an overall look at what is important when it comes to either in institutions or in services in general, uh, to keep viruses out of these and to protect um, people, it is something, when we take a look at elder care, what the federal government has basically missed as an opportunity. Not just in these institutions only, differently from the hospitals, for example, the basic care measures from disinfectants, face masks, arrived much later. So with major know-how and with an incredible input of billions, we looked after the hospitals getting well through this crisis, but where the crisis was arising, namely in outpatient care of elderly people, these measures arrived much too late. That is, we looked at the end, so to say, without taking a good look at the beginning. 
And there are a few things which did not go well. It is indeed true to say that. There are hardly any line lists in these institutions to document the context who was in touch with whom. An internal separation in long-term care, in inpatient care of infected persons, non-infected persons, or uh, suspected cases can just not work in institutions which have a, a capacity use of 90 or 95 percent. And of the medical task force, which when there is a chain infection, which who then come into the institution and organize additional help, we in Germany could hardly see anything like that. Yes, the word task force was uh, um, adopted by one German state government in Germany, Bavaria namely, they said, yes, we will have such task forces. But uh, this was rather bearing the character of when it, uh, uh, it was not about a new level of control, but we wanted to have enough hands intervening here. A situation report, uh, let alone a real-time situation report, this is something we cannot talk about at all, both in inpatient and in long-term care and also in medical care that is in the hospitals. This is true. And if we then also take a look at whether there was a COVID radar or a data collection, which then would also have uh, flowed into scientific evaluation. This is something that just didn't exist. Even the question of a so-called test regime was only discussed after more than half a year as to how this is organized and how an in inpatient elder care could be ensured to support these uh, facilities. It took months until one decided that the disaster organizations we have in Germany and also the federal armed forces were involved. So a realistic picture of the situation on site, well, there was so much isolated, lonely dying that should never have been allowed. And also we didn't have a unified PCR testing regime. It's depressing if we still see that in our contact phone with uh, uh, patient protection, we have to talk to family who have uh, still not overcome their grief as to the fact that they couldn't visit their beloved in the institutions. According to the law, this was possible, but in practice, many people did not die of COVID, but to make that very clear, of loneliness. And this is not visible in any statistics. This is, I think, uh, something should, that you do uh, to start with. Now, by the way, um, when I take a look at the media, also the uh, evaluation of COVID uh, does not cover this question hardly at all, even though we have to deplore most of the victims in this field. I will ask more uh, about the people with special care needs in the second round. And uh, now I want to continue with uh, Dr. Julia Fitzner, who's a medical doctor and epide epidemiologist. Uh, she's currently the unit head of insights and analytics at the World Health Organization's hub for epidemic and pandem pandemic intelligence based here in Berlin. Uh, Dr. Fitzner, your work has been extensively on collecting and analyzing worldwide data and enable enabling this information for decision makers, especially during pandemics and epidemics. So how would you describe the failures and successes of the last four years? How could we enhance the advisory processes at local and national levels? Yeah, thank you very much. And and first of all, thank you for for being invited. And I think it's it's actually it's really good to have these kind of exchanges and bring more of the different disciplinaries together so that we can discuss exactly these kind of things and how we can move forward. I think I'm I I think a lot everybody went through a lot of um really difficult times and everybody has a different view on what we were able to do what we should have been able to do and um and and a lot of it in general i think um, as our, my previous speaker was saying there's a lot of grief on what we went through and i think there are a lot of things that were difficult because it was a pandemic there's a lot of things that are difficult and that we could have done better and and some others that we couldn't have in terms of from my let's say uh, standpoint on where we where i was or um where i am uh, so as you said i was um in the 
I was responsible or with others, obviously, but um, on, on seeing the data at the global level and um, and helping to give uh, recommendations based on this data. And I think in terms of success, if you would have seen it on how it evolved, um, we were able to generate and use a lot of data faster than we were before. If you compare it to other um, pandemics and epidemics in before, um, we have we were able to have more. We also were able to have different disciplines step up and support the insights. A lot of people that were doing models, that were doing analytics, that were coming into the field to support um, the analytics. And also even, I think, which, which is a huge success, the education of, of the general population on what those data mean and where those data, data come from and how important data is to make those decisions actually has grown a lot over the time during those four years. So, I mean, just to, to mention a little bit, I, if you would have used terms like in, incidence or reproductive number um, four years ago, five years ago, nobody would have known, but now it's it's everybody that really knows them and knows how difficult it, it is to get them. So I think this kind of is a success on, on, on learning on how to enable them to move forward and really get a bit more insights in exactly these terms. There was also a lot of inf information and people were willing to collaborate on them, but it wasn't easy. And this is now coming a bit to the failures and, and where we are now and where we hopefully can actually move towards is that um, we we there was a lot of data, as I said, but it was very uh, fragmented and very inaccessible, often not digitalized. Um, very different in different countries, um, very different on how we were, how there was access. Some people, in some cases, it was just that the data just wasn't collected, but often it was collected and it wasn't, we weren't able to really use that collected data and make use of the really important pieces of data because we weren't able to bring them together. So accessing and linking the data was really challenging and even finding where we would get it as well. Um, and finally, if we got the data, and this is then sort of bringing it to the context of the data, it was not enough additional information that really would make the interpretation of the data easy and we also were lacking the um, type of algorithms that would help us use really this kind of more additional data to it in order to make the best use of it. And so this brings me to that we had data owners or people that knew the data and the context of, of the situation. But on the other hand, we were really lacking tools um, that or the people that had the data were lacking the the tools or the expertise to really use them. And then on the other hand, it was difficult to really find a good, reliable um, code or algorithm. There were there's a mil there are actually if you look in in on the um, on the web in GitHub, there are now more than two hundred and fifty thousand pieces of code that were shared to use for COVID, but it was really difficult to find find the one that would help you or find people that could help you then deploy it or use it. And so, and also um, some people would have liked to share data, but what wanted to keep the privacy. So this kind of possibility to actually use data in a more federated way also wasn't really uh, easy. And um, last but not least, using then the insight from different groups that were doing very sophisticated analysis wasn't necessarily done in the best way. So that, and and I mean, it comes with delay in in uh, decisions. It comes with delay in recommendations um, because the results were taking a lot of time. Scrutiny wasn't there. 
um, and um, and the people that needed to take the decision weren't able to to necessarily uh, get the evidence based results or understand the differences in the in the different uh, results that were offered, and so it's um it would it was often a problem of of taking the best analysis available at the time the decision needed to be taken, and then also the problem a bit um, on how decisions that were taken, how they are then, how the uncertainty around why that decision was done and what kind of use was made out of the data on how to sort of be flexible around them. So I think for me, in terms of hindsight, I think we there were successes. We did. There was a lot of collaboration. There was a lot of use of data. And if you only, one thing that I also want to sort of state in, in this as well is we, we, yes, we did a lot of, there was a lot of grief due to the restrictions that were done. But if, but one also has to see that um, if those restrictions wouldn't have been done, the outcome would have been a lot more disastrous. And um, we often forget uh, the situations that were showing that it was really going wrong in some of the uh, countries in some instances. And there were, and those restrictions did help to prevent even worse. And this, we will never sh know what this worse would have been, but I think um, that there is, um, that we clearly did a lot of right steps to prevent even worse. So thank you very much for that, for now. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Fitz. Now, a lot of interesting insights on how much is learned actually about sharing and linking the data. And then we will come back to the decision making uh, very soon. And uh, my next question will be for Professor Susan Mishi. Uh, she's Professor of Health Psychology and Director of the Center for Behavior Change at University College London. Uh, her research focuses on human behavior change in relation to health and environment. And Professor Mishi, uh, in addition to your academic functions, you also serve as an expert advisor on the UK's COVID-19 Scientific Pandemic Insights Group on Behavioral Science. So how would you describe your experiences with the responses to COVID-19 and how could the advisory process be improved? Thanks very much. Good to uh, be here. Um, I was actually on the scientific advisory group and emergencies advising the UK government in 2009 during the H1N1 pandemic, as well as um, during this during COVID-19. And I, just in response to your last speaker, I um, want to mention one thing that I think our government did extremely well is in 2009, it took a long time for relevant studies to get up and running because they had to get ethics approval. They had to do piloting. And so they set up some and funded what they called sleeping proposals of, of, of research that would need to be done very quickly at the beginning of a pandemic. And I was part of one of those, which was a survey, a weekly survey of 2000 people representative of the population all over the UK about key behaviours and the influences on behaviour. And because we had piloted, got ethics approval, and we'd updated it over time, again funded, we were able to start as soon as the pandemic started. So we had excellent um, evidence that we could um, advise our um, government's communication strategy right from the beginning. And that's a model. It was from our National Institute of Health Research funding, probably funded about a dozen key large studies. I think it's a model that other countries could um, learn from. In terms of the advisory process, it's a very interesting experience. There were some things we did extremely well. Um, it was set up immediately because uh, we had a chief scientific advisor and chief medical officer there. Um, probably in the, in, the, in the main group, there was over 100 people all told. And then there were lots of subgroups. Um, you mentioned the behavioral one, there was a modeling one, there was a, a clinical and virology one, and they all fed reports in to the main group. And um, just the behavioral group alone published more than 100 evidence-based reports in response to government uh, questions. 
And the people who served on these were the leading scientists in the country, relevant scientists. So it was full of talent. But there are some things that I think um, could be done better next time. Um, one is that um, it was a very reactive model. We had to wait for the government to ask their questions. We couldn't say, we think there's a big problem, say, of adherence in this community, and we have the evidence that could inform a strategy to address this. We had to wait. So being um, reactive rather than proactive, I think, is, is one limitation. Um, it was very one way. So we didn't have um, links with policymakers and practitioners. The mantra was very much scientists advise, pol policymakers decide. Um, but the problem about this um, division is to some extent it's artificial. And also if you're making evidence-based advice um, that is to do with human behavior, which most pandemic management is, it's really important to understand context, the policy context, and the operational details um, that the advice will land in. And by separating policymakers and scientists, we don't learn more about the policy context. Policymakers don't learn more about science. So I've advised government over many decades. And my experience is a partnership approach where you have good relationships, good rapport is always best. So that was one thing that I, I think could, second thing, um, be, be uh, proactive and have a two-way partnership um, arrangement. Um, the other thing, and I'll come on to this uh, later, is that um, we only communicated with the outside world that through our published reports that went onto the government website, sometimes weeks later. So for example, the very last one that I led on that was a very important one about how do you maintain behavior change at a population level after the rules have gone away? You know, how do you enable the population to have a risk assessment and risk management approach about looking after their own health and that of their loved ones and communities? Uh, it was an excellent report. It's up there on the website still. It was delayed almost three months by the government because they didn't want to publish it before July the 20th, 2022, which they called Freedom Day. And so it's completely lost. So we, all of the scientists um, had very, very busy full-time jobs and were doing this all on top of um, our, our day jobs. And so it's quite demoralizing to be spending all one's evenings and weekends working at pace to bring out these reports when asked to find that they weren't being um, uh, uh, implemented. And one of the other things I think the rooms for improvement is that the process wasn't transparent. We don't know who our reports went to within the system. All we know is that the chief scientific advisor and the chief medical officer had meetings with our cabinet officer, the prime minister, etc. But we don't know what they said to them. And we don't know where our reports went to. So unless we know what the um, process is, of translation from the scientific advice to policymakers and potential practitioners in the system, we don't know, did it ever get to the right people? If it got to the right people, did they read them? If they read them, did they understand them? If they understood them, did they just not want to implement them because of maybe scientific misunderstanding or maybe ideological opposition? We simply don't know. And if we don't have data, about our own processes. If we don't evaluate our own processes, we can't improve in the future. So that's uh, also something that I think needs to be improved. And the final thing is that we were really very discouraged, not only from having contact with policymakers or even mentioning policy in our reports. So for example, that final report, I included, um, or the group that wrote this that I was leading included, examples of what policy could look like in terms of implementing various recommendations. The chief scientific advisor asked us to take them all out. They didn't want even any examples. And my experience of working with policymakers is they want examples. They want to talk in the language that they're familiar with. They want things to be made concrete, not just at a kind of more abstract scientific level. And maybe associated with that, 
we were really discouraged from um, talking to the media. And I think it's so important that scientific understanding and evidence gets out to the whole population. It's not only these are the rules, but it's, it's helping people develop a mental model as to what's going on. How is this virus being transmitted? Why are the rules as they are? And speaking to the public is incredibly important. Um, and it came out during the public inquiry that actually there'd been emails around between the prime minister, our chief scientific advisor, um, asking us not to be talking so much to the media. But I'll leave it there and um, come on to talking about um, another role I had um, in parallel with this role where we were engaging more directly with the public. Thanks. Well, thank you for the thought-provoking uh, examples. And yes, we're going to talk more about the more proactive models and uh, science communication or alternative ways to for science communication. And now I want to introduce Professor Bruno Arpino, who is a full professor of social statistics at the Department of Statistical Sciences, University of Padua. And his research interests span and uh, applied statistics, social gerontology, and demography. And Professor Arpino, uh, you investigated the role of family relations in favoring the adaptation of anti-COVID behaviors and shifts in well-being and fertility decisions during the pandemic. And how would you reflect on the same questions? What were the successes and failures of last four years? Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, organizing this very interesting debate and for inviting me to contribute to, to it. Uh, well, talking about the failures and successes of the policies and measures that have been implemented uh, since the start of the COVID pandemic uh, is very difficult. Uh, now, it's uh, four years after the outbreak of the pandemic, it would be easy to blame specific institutions for what has been done or what has not been done. Um, however, I think that uh, what is in, more important is to understand the systemic failures uh, and, in some cases, uh, successes. Uh, I mean that uh, most of the failures and the successes uh, that we um, had during the pandemic are in fact um, failures and successes of the uh, pre-COVID uh, systems. Uh, some people argue that the pandemic was not a black swan, but it, it was more a black elephant. Uh, I uh, see the, the pandemic as a sort of big uh, light uh, that highlighted uh, existing uh, difficulties and um, issues in our societies and in our institutions. Um, so when we uh, look at uh, countries or institutions that uh, manage um, better or worse uh, the consequences of the pandemic, um, we usually uh, identify systems that were more resilient or less resilient uh, because pre-COVID, they were better prepared or worse prepared. So uh, talking about the successes, I think that the, great, uh, the greatest success was the reaction of the um, international research community. Uh, well, um, in a relatively short term, um, the research community was able to produce uh, therapies and information about the, uh, the mechanisms uh, with which the virus was transmitted, and uh, later uh, the vaccine. So this was a big uh, success, I think. And um, more generally, uh, the research community re react reacted quite rapidly, uh, also uh, outside medicine and biology. Uh, talking about my field, in, in our field we started uh, trying to understand how the pandemic was impacting the uh, family relations, for example, and how family relation, on the other hand, was uh, responsible or not for the, uh, the spread of the, uh, the pandemic. So talking about this uh, specific uh, field, at the very beginning of the, uh, the pandemic, uh, the family was blamed to be uh, responsible for the, uh, the spread of the virus, and if we uh, remember uh, the, um, the, the first phases of the pandemic, Italy and Spain, that are two countries that are typically characterized as uh, being familialist, uh, where 
family member tend to live together very close to each other. Uh, they tend to have very frequent uh, connections among uh, each other. Um, so it was uh, argued that um, these countries were severely hit by the pandemic also because of these uh, characteristics of being very familialistic. Uh, however, we started collecting data and we didn't find uh, strong evidence that this was a, uh, one of the main, um, uh, main um, mechanisms behind the spread of the pandemic. Uh, this was not to say that uh, family relations as all form of uh, in-person contact was not a risk for spreading the pandemic. Uh, but we uh, also theorized that family links and uh, all other type of links may also um, uh, help in fighting the pandemic. So in um, uh, we analyzed, for example, uh, behaviors of individuals, and we found that uh, individuals that had a close relationship with a partner or children were actually more likely to, uh, to follow the... Uh, health recommendation to wear a mask, for example, uh, get the vaccine. Uh, so we, we, don't, we don't have to, uh, to see family relations and relations in general only as a risk factor for spreading a virus, but actually also uh, a tool uh, to fight the pandemic uh, through um, support and social control, um, and also uh, in terms of reducing the uh, mental health consequences that affected many people uh, during lockdown period and because of the, uh, the several measures that have been implemented to, to fight the, uh, the pandemic that also induced people to reduce in-person contact. So we know that um, loneliness feelings and feelings of depression have increased. And uh, those people that had uh, maintained some uh, connections, um, typically with uh, family members, um, were able uh, to better cope with the uh, with the consequences of the um, of the pandemic. Uh, well, the um, uh, I, I'm I tend to uh, to agree with the the first speaker that overall the the reactions of different institutions at different level was a a big uh, failure, but as I was saying, this is a failure of the uh, pre-COVID systems. Um, talking about Italy, uh, that is the the country uh, with which I'm more, most familiar, uh, Italy was not uh, well prepared uh, for the pandemic. Uh, we did have um, a pre-pandemic um, um, plan, but this was an old one, was not updated, um, and uh, the um, the healthcare system was also not prepared uh, because the responsibilities for um, uh, the healthcare system in Italy are divided at different levels, national, regional, local, and uh, there's a lack of clarity about the uh, specific responsibility and there, there was a lack of uh, coordination among the different uh, actors in the care system. Um, at the very beginning of the pandemic, the, uh, the emphasis was put on uh, the hospitals and um, the government was able to create new, uh, more places in hospitals, also new uh, hospitals dedicated to the um, COVID pandemic. But this was at the detriment of uh, non-hospital care, uh, first of all, uh, nursing home, uh, that in the very first moments of the pandemic were, were uh, overlooked. And these, of course, as we know, uh, had a big impact on uh, in terms of mortality and also um, in terms of the, the stress uh, that uh, affected uh, caregivers uh, in the nursing home and also family uh, members. So um, we need uh, to fight possible future uh, pandemic or crisis, uh, we need to be better prepared. And the key um, key element in, in this, of course, is investment in, in research uh, in all fields, not only in uh, medicine, but uh, in, uh, in, um, in all aspects of our life that have been impacted by, uh, by the pandemic. And uh, another, uh, so related to these, uh, investment in technologies, uh, 
are very important. Um, digital technologies, for example, that helped a lot of people uh, during the uh, the lockdown, but uh, during the several phases of the pandemic where uh, in-person contact have been uh, reduced. Um, so digital technologies have helped people to to maintain some social contact uh, and uh, reduce the the negative impact of uh, the pandemic. Uh, also, the language that has been used uh, should uh, have been different. So often we have confused uh, physical distancing and social distancing. Um, of course, to fight the pandemic, physical distancing was uh, crucial. Uh, but many times uh, the media, policymakers, but also researchers talked about social um, social distance. And this created uh, some confusion. And in some cases, people thought that uh, social contact and social relationship in general should have been reduced. Uh, however, I think that for uh, the next pandemic, uh, we need to think about isolating uh, not individuals, but probably uh, small networks on the, of individuals. Um, this, this is because we know that social relationships are crucial uh, in terms of emotional support, but also in terms of uh, exchanging uh, information about uh, uh, medical treatment, for example, um, or more generally uh, to exchange practical support um, and isolate, completely isolating people, um, it proved to be very uh, difficult, they're probably ineffective. Uh, so uh, a good strategy that should be uh, taught and planned for the future is to think about ways to uh, isolating in, when necessary, uh, small groups of people that can be family-based or uh, non-family uh, based. And in terms of enhancing the uh, the communication between research, researcher, policymakers, and stakeholders, I also uh, think that this is uh, very important. And one key element here is to uh, is trust. Uh, during the pandemic, some um, so we had an explosion of um, misinformation and fake news. Uh, so people have to know uh, which sources of information are uh, reliable and can be uh, trusted. And I think that uh, inter interconnection between policymakers, uh, media, and researcher is crucial to, um, to explain what is known about the, the virus or whatever uh, phenomenon and to uh, communicate uh, good research. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity. And thank you, Professor Arpino. Very interesting points. I mean, uh, you all partly responded to it, but I want to switch our focus more on the science communication or the communication of scientific uh, findings and advice. And this in this round, I want to ask you for shorter answers so we can save some time also from for the questions from our old, uh, online audience continue with you actually you already mentioned the importance of the language and you have done also research on older uh, target groups and COVID-19 measures so can you share your research findings on how decision makers have either succeeded or faced challenges in reaching out to older generations yeah uh, thank you this is a very interesting uh, topic in my opinion um, so especially during the first phases of the pandemic, there was a, um, a language or a communication style that uh, increased uh, ageism. Um, so it, it was uh, quite evident that older people were at a higher risk of um, experiencing negative health consequences uh, when infected by the, uh, the virus. Uh, however, older people were depicted as a homogeneous, frail group. Um, however, we we know that uh, people, let's say, sixty-five plus or whatever, uh, are not an homogeneous group. Uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, con the the pandemic consequences were especially um, uh, serious for uh, people that had uh, some multimorbidity. So even older people were not an homogeneous group. Uh, instead, this discourse of depicting older people as frail 
um, uh, as I was saying, uh, created some ages. And this was evident in the social media. Uh, as an example, it, uh, it was created in Nashtag, the uh, uh, boomer remover. Uh, of course, this is an extreme example. Uh, but it, it exemplified the, um, uh, what happened in the, um, in, the, in the public. So the, the public was seeing older people as a sort of uh, cost uh, that was imposing a lockdown and very severe measures to these uh, this was not completely respecting the 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 truth uh, it was not only all the people that were at risk of um experiencing uh that and serious illness consequences uh when infected but also younger people uh, in case of uh, multimorbidity uh, for example so what I think uh, we should learn from uh, the pandemic is uh, that we should um, be more careful when we design uh, policies, but also when we uh, communicate uh, policy measures or also research uh, fundings. And we should always um, remember that uh, there is a lot of heterogeneity uh, in the population, but even in subgroups like uh, older people. Not older people uh, reacted the same to the pandemic because there were some people in, for example, in nursing home or isolated because they were living um, alone or uh, they, uh, they were in a bad health condition and so they needed care. So these subgroup of the older people uh, were mostly affected by the pandemic. And as I was saying also before, uh, policymakers uh, neglected the, the focus on these special subgroups. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you very much also mentioning this uh, diversity of target groups. Uh, even when we talk about uh, older people, it's not just the homogeneous group of people. So I want to actually uh, ask Ask the same question or the similar question to Eugen Brisch. Mr. Brisch, uh, how would you already kind of hint that, but uh, how would you consider the experiences with different target groups uh, like older people, people, people with uh, special careness? Were they properly acknowledged and addressed when communicating the measures or vaccination against COVID-19? What, what are your insights? I think I think we have to differentiate between uh, the measures which came uh, with the vaccines and the measures taken before vaccination was possible. So we have to understand when it um, it's about uh, taking looking at long term care and practice, where also most of the victims. Uh, occurred that the focus of this practical long-term care was hardly involved in our expert bodies of the German government and also of the German lender. This group was actually absolutely underrepresented. Sometimes it was even missing completely. And this is interesting because at the end of the day, it was especially that group which they wanted to protect in the first place. I'm very grateful to Mr. Arpino that he related to this very clearly, that not every um, target group has the same risks. And that is why we said at a very early stage already, it's not about doing everything, but doing the right things. So putting the focus on the right problems, but in the, among the political players, they had a very difficult time in uh, implementing this part and uh, in the practical work. So one example, another, an example which explains this very clearly is how much we focused on hospitals in Germany. Much more than in Italy, we relied on um, uh, inpatient offers. We have, of course, a totally different uh, level of intensive care. But uh, we could also see that hospitals reached the maximum of their um, capacities. Today, we can, of course, exaggerating, uh, say that in the first phase of the pandemic of the year, it was almost um, nothing to do in hospitals. So, um, of course, in the hospitals where they did have COVID patients, there was a lot of work. But in general, during the first period, um, when it comes to the other offers, both cancer therapy or stroke or um, coronal uh, 
insufficiency, there was the absurd case that the doctors and care takers were sent home asking them either to generate over or to, to build to, to reduce overtime work or sometimes they were really freed uh, from office so uh, there's a really dis differentiated picture and uh, when we look at this uh, the only chance to not repeat the um, failures of the past in a future pandemic when we look at um, so at this data. We heard about uh, the scientific expertise already. The question whether we can really be better prepared um, to have some kind of a pandemic right, uh, that is something I would doubt. Uh, now we have to live with this virus, but the question is whether we learned to, um, to avoid structural failures in that way if, uh, which we committed. There is one point which is still not clear and which needs to be taken into account is the question, how can it be that in one cohort of patients, we could see this in the nursing homes, people were living together in one room and one was um, infected and died from the virus and the other one who actually developed the same symptoms or similar symptoms or has a similar age was not even infected. So these pathways need to be researched more in detail so that we can really have, draw conclusions for the future. And that means that the, we have to face the challenges to learn from these failures. And we um, heard it already, the Achilles heel, which was mentioned by Professor were really uh, outlined where the weaknesses lie in all our uh, health systems. Uh, the virus was really very uh, effective. So what was the result of it? Uh, what are the kinds of um, lessons learned from these weaknesses in order to make our healthcare systems more resilient and also to take the right measures among the personal resources and to come up with measures and plans and policies which will really be a practical help. There was only one uh, regional government in North Rhine West failure which wanted to see this link between the um, health caretakers and, uh, and doctors which failed uh, tremendously because actually uh, each of these groups has a very clear uh, picture of their job and they were not really prepared to support uh, or to take up other um, works and to, to detach from their uh, own structures in order to organize internal uh, assistance. But that's a challenge we have to face. We also have to um, underpin this with certain laws and uh, that is why we did not even organize this at uh, the regional level for Germany. You have to know that all those policies have uh, to be taken at regional level. Disaster management also is an issue of the lender. Uh, however, the population believed that the chancellor or the federal government, the prime minister, those rounds were really taking decisions. But believe me, that was absolute nonsense. That was quite a nice talking um, group where, however, no decisions could be taken. In Germany, healthcare um, decisions are only taken at the level of the regional states or uh, federal states. Of course, the federal government can come up with some uh, frame uh, conditions. They can, of course, organize the issue, issuance of vaccines. Uh, but it's uh, it's up to the uh, regional states, federal states, who have to take the decisions. And as regards Germany, uh, I can I, I can imagine that uh, people abroad can hardly Im imagine how this policy could really work, because it was actually we had to deal with the pandemic, was, which was crossing all the international borders, and in Germany it was. Um, very difficult to organize this at the very low level of the regions. And I really don't know how we should set it up in the future. We would really have to think uh, on a very wide political level of decision-making processes and the involvement of parliament at federal level and of uh, regional level was really not a very good example for democratic decision-making. So there are lots of things which need to be processed and it's very good that we have this round to talk about this and to put the focus really on the points where it really hurts rather than to the points where it is just uh, common.
making examples when speaking about this. Decision making and the structures that we have uh, at this point, I want to switch to Dr. Fitzner, uh, World Health Organization's Hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence, published a recent report on advanced the analytics to inform decision making uh, during the public health emergencies. So can you share some examples and suggestions on engaging political decision makers and establishing networks? Yeah, thanks a lot. And, and I think a lot has already been 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 said in, in exactly this kind of regard. Um, taking a little bit what um, uh, uh, learning from the UK as well, um, I think um, we have seen that we really need to strengthen pre-existing networks with different disciplines. And obviously, even this, this forum is one of those examples. It helps a lot if there is communication pre-established, that people know how to sort of um, communicate with, with each other and even sort of understand each other because every discipline uses partially um, different language and doesn't necessarily um, then communicate them further in the same way that it was in, in anticipated. So that really the need for building networks beforehand and exchanging information and, uh, and data and analysis and ways of communication is extremely important. And what we saw in the different countries and, and, and bringing together um, policymakers and the analysts here to sort of really discuss more in detail on, on, on and open on who, ha, what worked and what didn't work. One crucial role, and it was mentioned before, is this, is this role of an information broker between these kind of groups. And we think that this is an area where we probably need more training, where we need to have maybe a full new um, group of uh, that it is a new area era to to train and bring those people forward that are communicators that are potentially um, journalists that are more in the connected already with it between the scientists as well as the decision makers. There was a lot of very good work in some countries to, uh, moving forward and some others where that really failed. And also, as said before, in um, uh, the kind of um, systems, the political systems that were more enabling or more hindering that this kind of communication was honest and straightforward and um and on the other hand and this is also was mentioned and i think is but is i i do want to reiterate the the need for explanations of what is uncertainty um sometimes it is um it is and and how do we wiggle back on decisions that were made on on decisions uh, on on data or on information that was not yet so crystal clear we want to be fast and fast means that we don't have all the information at hand but it also means that we we should be able to go back and this these are circles that need to be explained clearly and communicated clearly otherwise if we wait until the best evidence and the best information and even the best ways of communicating it is out there misinformation has more place and will gain over the true information. So I think often the people that had data, that had information, they hold back because they were in, they were too unsure how to best communicate. And that left a lot of room for more misinterpretation. But to fill this kind of gap, we need these systems already existing beforehand, and we need to plan on how to best do that pre-existing, like the pre-existing networks, the pre-existing protocols to do things, testing them out on, on normal, not so pandemic um, infectious outbreaks is crucial so that we are prepared for the next one. And um, and the Berlin Hub here sort of was, was created to, uh, to bring forward more of these kind of interactions. And we are planning to, or we are building sort of um, we, we call it a collaboratory where the different um, analysts can work together to actually um, bring in their results work on on joint models on how to move forward 
but then also of linking the decision makers or decision takers to actually interact and ask the questions and hopefully build a digital environment where these networks can exist. So that is a little bit where, where we are moving towards and where we hope that we have understood some of the lessons learned and and, and change them for, for the next to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fitzner. And maybe we can continue with Professor Mishi. Uh, I think it's also very related uh, to what you already described. Uh, Professor Mishi, can you talk more about the uh, independent SAGE? It's a group of scientists working together to provide independent scientific uh, advice to the government, but also for to the public on how to minimize deaths and support Britain's uh, recovery from the COVID-19 crisis and uh, we have our last four or five minutes for you to <laughs> dedicate on the sage independent thank you and i'll also address the um question that's been put in the q a um uh, section two um for the first few weeks um sage the scientific advisory group in emergencies was secret uh, the members were secret the uh, reports were secret and the minutes were secret and I was one of the very few people who was open about the fact that I was serving on this committee. A former chief scientific advisor, Sir David King, was rather horrified by this, as he had um, served two governments, both Blair and Brown, uh, when there had been other health emergencies, and had got agreement to speak directly to the public. And um, the reason for doing this, as your previous speakers have um, mentioned, is the absolute key issue of trust. If the population don't trust what's being told to them, they're much more likely to be adherent. And there's more and more evidence about quite how important this is. We know that politicians are generally very untrusted, mistrusted, distrusted, um, but scientists generally are well-trusted. So when David King found out about the secrecy, he then set up this group of about 15 to 20 scientists, again, very multidisciplinary, um, to meet together to discuss issues that we um, thought were really of prominent importance and hold weekly broadcasts. So every Friday, lunchtime, as a YouTube channel, anybody can go up and look Independent Sage. We had a, an hour, at least an hour, um, where we um, did a data update we produced the up-to-date data about um, the, the incidence levels and uh, prevalence in different areas, uh, the inequalities, um, the hospitalizations, the deaths, all the key data for people to understand in a very easy way. We also had um, we had a, youth, um, a uh, website and also a, a Twitter account as it was then. And so the public could ask questions directly. So every week, members of the public came onto the onto the channel and asked us questions, and um, we would uh, answer them to the best of our ability. Now we routinely got twenty thousand people um, viewing this. The maximum we got was one hundred and fifty thousand. There was a massive need for this because the the government communication was so poor. And um, in response to the the question in the in the in the a chat here, it says, in Germany, some scientific disagreements during the COVID crisis were perceived by the public as unsettling. To what extent should the scientific debate in such moments be communicated to a broader public or not? Well, this comes back to trust, to the issue about uncertainty that the previous um, panelists spoke about, that if you are open with, this is what our understanding of the best scientific evidence at the moment is, and you communicate that, you also communicate that um, this that any one question needs to have often information from virology, immunology, behavioral science, epidemiology, et cetera. And so what we try to do is bring together the different um, evidence from different scientific disciplines and put them together as a picture to answer questions. But we've always said, that, that this is a moving picture, that evidence is changing, the virus is changing, people's behavior is changing. And so how we interpret, not only does the evidence change over time, we, we have more of it and better, 
but also how we interpret it um, differs too. And I think if you talk to the public in this way and you actually educate them about the scientific process, it's a good thing. And I think people can understand the notion of uncertainty and much better to do it than, you know, as was said before, like rowing back. I don't think you ever need to row back. You move forward, but you should move forward taking the public with you. And we also did have some disagreements and we aired those. And we said, you know, well, I think that for these reasons, I would favor this policy. And somebody else would say, well, I think for these reasons, I'd, I'd favor that. One example I really remember was about vaccine passports. And there was a really, there's, there was different points of view between those who are coming at it from a very inequalities angle and concerned about people being excluded compared to, and especially in certain um, marginalized population, compared to those who are coming at it from a very public health angle. And that's fine. And we were able to discuss that in a group, grown up way. And the public like to see that. They can see that there is uncertainty, there's different perspectives, but the process is bringing it together um, so that people can understand it. And we kept going, we, we kept, we kept thinking we can't keep this going in addition to our day jobs and from myself being on stage. But every time we thought we would, we should finish, um, we just got inundated with people pleading with us to keep going. So we actually kept going for over three years and only at Christmas did we um, stop. But everywhere I go, whether it's in my local hood, whether I go to festivals, whatever, People recognize me and come up to me and say, thank you so much. And we get emails every day from people thanking us for our work. So I think this is a really, and it's not instead of a formal government scientific advisory group. And in fact, a lot of the advice was very similar, but I think it's a really important parallel complementary um, stream of advice. And we have not only um, the public coming on and asking us questions. We had people from political parties. We had local government officers. We had uh, people from the press and broadcasting media coming on. And so it was very much an open channel to address questions that people had at the time. We also had lots of guests and we provided space for people um, with lived experience of COVID or from very vulnerable um, communities, young people, um, excluded communities. So we we had a range of people, as well as top experts coming from WHO, the states, etc., uh, to address particular topics. So it was a very evolutionary um, experience. It was re very responsive uh, to what people were um, asking for and wanting. Um, I haven't come across um, any any model like that in any other country. We've written one article about it that's been published. We're just currently writing another one. But I really would say that um, for any any um, you know threat where you want to get the trust of people and you want the population to behave in ways that will protect themselves and others, having really high quality, open, good communication is absolutely essential. And I'm really proud of uh, Independent Sage and what they achieved um, and, and a very, very, a supportive uh, group to each other, as well as to all the communities uh, that we worked with. And also we had a huge profile. Um, you know, we have, must have done between us tens of thousands of, of media interactions, which again, I think is important. And I think it's really important for scientists to engage with the public. I don't believe in a, a separation. And I also think we should equip scientists, not only to be able to talk to the media and the public, but also to talk in a broad way, not just the narrow particular topic one is working on. And we learned a huge amount from each other. So the, the kind of one of the other mantras that our chief scientific advisor had was stay in your lane. Don't talk about other things. But I think if you're well informed and you're addressing topics where you do have to draw on other disciplines, it's a strength. And often if I was asked questions that I wasn't completely sure about, I would just say, I'm not sure about that, but my understanding from my co colleagues in whatever it might be, virology, is this. And then I go back and check it out um, and, and learn in that way. So I hope that's uh, helpful, a very, very different model. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor Mishi, and many thanks to our, our old panel.
panelists uh, for their engaging contributions. I think it's a good place to conclude our discussion here. There will be more panels on crisis, resilience and science and policy policy communication today and next two days. I personally have inspiring takeaways uh, from the session and thank you to our own online uh, audience for participating and sharing your questions. And uh, so you can stay or use the same link and yeah, see you on the next uh, panels. Thank you all.